published today is a review on the failure of physiological transformation and spiral artery atherosis, the roles in preeclampsia, summarizing current knowledge and concepts and proposing further areas for research. The blood to the uterus is supplied by the uterine arteries via the radial to the spiral arteries, which are non-branching arteries with a corkscrew shape. In pregnancy, the uterine endometrium is transformed into decidua. The decida basalis is penetrated by the spiral arteries that deliver blood into the placental intervillous space. This crucial blood flow is enabled by a 5 to 10 fold increase in arterial diameter from non pregnancy state, following an extensive remodeling of the spiral artery walls in the first half of pregnancy. Prior to 9 weeks of gestation, extravillous trophoblasts plug the spiral arteries and hinder maternal blood to enter the intervillous space. This helps to maintain hypoxia early in the placentation process. Prior to the unplugging and start of the uteroplacental circulation around 9 weeks, uterine glands provide nutrition for the fetus. Physiological remodeling of the uteroplacental spiral arteries is key to a successful pregnancy and involves complex interactions between maternal and fetal cells in the uterine wall. The spiral artery remodeling process is divided into five stages by Pine and et al., which are summarized in the review. In normal remodeling, smooth muscle cells are replaced by invading trophoblasts as well as fibrinoids. This normal remodeling is complete both in the decida basalis and also deep into the underlying myometrium. The loss of smooth muscle cells and their autonomic innovation leads to functional changes in arterial wall reactivity, enhanced vasodilatation and a major decrease in uterine vascular resistance. The remodeling of the spiral arteries into highly dilated thin wall vessels leads to optimal uteroplacental blood flow. This helps to maintain normal placental function and for meeting the high demands of the growing fetus. Placental extravillous trophoblasts invading the uterine spiral arteries express only HDSC among the classical polymorphic class 1 HLAs. HDSC is a key molecule that can elicit immune responses by maternal decidual immune cells. Good remodeling depends on such adequate maternal fetal cell interaction. The deciduous immune system, including maternal natural killer cells and T cells, including regulatory T cells, are both facilitating uteroplacental spiral artery modeling. The maternal decidual NK cells express KIR proteins, which are receptors binding to fetal HLC on the invasive trophoblasts. The decidual NK cells also develop trained memory after first pregnancy, possibly explaining why placentation is more efficient in subsequent pregnancies with the same partner within the next decade. Decidual Tregs are also important for promoting maternal fetal immune tolerance by several mechanisms discussed in the review. The result of a normal deep invasion of trophoblasts and remodeling of spiral arteries deep into the uterine myometrium is a stable blood flow at low pressure into the placenta intervillous space. Poor remodeling of the uteroplacental spiral arteries is found in early onset preeclampsia and several other major obstetric syndromes, including fetal growth restriction. Robertson and collaborators demonstrated in 1967 shallow remodeling of the uteroplacental spiral arteries in preeclampsia. Lyle et al. showed that this is the endovascular trophoblast invasion that is shallow, whereas the interstitial trophoblast invasion remains normal in preeclampsia. This failure of deep spiral artery remodeling was previously assumed to lead to placental underperfusion and thereby chronic hypoxia. A 2009 model by Burton et al. argues that blood flow volume is minimally affected, but that uteroplacental perfusion will be more pulsatile and with higher pressure flow, partly due to the remaining contractile smooth muscle cells. This abnormal flow generates ischemia repulsion injury, endoplasmic reticulum stress, as well as oxidative stress. The malperfusion leads to cell restress of the sensitive trophoblasts and increased release of inflammatory factors to the mother. This mediates an excessive maternal vascular inflammation, resulting in the maternal clinical features of preeclampsia, including new onset hypertension. The inflammatory factors include sensitive trophoblast microvesicles and dysregulated soluble FLIT1. This figure illustrates a two-step preeclampsia model suggested in 1991 by Chris Redman. Preeclampsia pathophysiology involves, however, more than poor spiral artery modeling affected by immunological factors. Periconceptional endometrial function, trophoblast shell, plugging and unplugging of the spiral arteries are some factors discussed in the review. Poor placentation increases the risk for early severe placental dysfunction and early onset preeclampsia, where fetal growth restriction is common. 
Late onset preeclampsia, however, is more common than early onset, but has most often normal presentation and fetal growth restriction is uncommon. We have suggested that late onset preeclampsia may be caused by overcrowding of terminal villi in large placentas and also by more rapidly aging placentas, leading to placenta stress late in pregnancy and thereby less effect on fetal growth. The review discusses how obesity and other risk factors for preeclampsia may impact multiple pathways to placental dysfunction, and also how obesity may increase the vascular maternal response to inflammatory factors shed from the dysfunctional placenta. Hence, we propose that the pathways to early and late onset preeclampsia may differ in timing and underlying causes, but that both forms may lead to same maternal signs of disease. Acute atherosis is a subendothelial foam cell lesion of the uteroplacental spiral arteries and prevalent in preeclampsia. The foam cell lesions are often accompanied by fibrinoid necrosis and perivascular leukocyte infiltration. Acute atherosis shares some morphological features with early stages of atherosclerosis, but molecular differences between these lesions are summarized in review. Acute atherosis usually occurs at the tips of the spiral arteries in the decida basalis, less often in the myometrium. Reported rates of acute atherosis vary from 10 to 52% in preeclampsia, likely reflecting differences in study populations, in tissue sampling techniques and diagnostic criteria. Acute atherosis also affects normotensive fetal growth restriction and systemic lupus, and sometimes even pregnancies that remain uncomplicated. Our technique of decidal vacuum suction is an efficient sampling method to study the decida basalis spiral arteries. A simplified acute atherosis definition is based on at least two adjacent foam cells in the spiral artery wall that are also CD68 positive. CD68 is a scavenger receptor for oxidized lipids and expressed by foam cells and macrophages. Foam cells are products of inflammatory stress and are characteristic of early stages of atherosclerosis. Foam cells are not, however, specific to atherosclerosis, but may form in several inflammatory states as reviewed in the paper. We have proposed that multiple forms of decidual vascular inflammation may lead to the degeneration of foam cells and spiral artery acute atherosis. Poor spiral artery modeling will result in altered downstream laminar blood flow, promoting endothelial shear stress and stimulating foam cell generation. Another cause of inflammation may be local maternal immune responses to the genetically distinct fetal trophoblast cells. Fetal and maternal genetics, as well as local decidual and maternal systemic inflammatory risk factors, may be involved, also without presence of failed spiral artery modeling. We have suggested that uteroplacental acute atherosis could develop at any stage of pregnancy in the setting of sufficient decidual inflammation, in line with some women developing acute atherosis very early in pregnancy, such as in systemic lupus erythematosus. We propose that acute atherosis represents an accelerated atherosclerotic process, driven by the dramatic physiological and inflammatory changes that occur in pregnancy. The review discusses if acute atherosis represents both a consequence of placental dysfunction, but also a risk factor for generating further placental dysfunction. Acute atherosis has been associated with more severe preeclampsia forms, including preterm delivery and fetal growth restriction. Epidemiologically, these syndromes are associated with increased risk for premature maternal cardiovascular disease. We have suggested that the subset of women who develop acute atherosis lesions in pregnancy may have increased risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease later in life. Early stages of atherosclerosis are reversible, and statins have anti-atherogenic and anti-inflammatory effects. We have suggested that statins may possibly improve acute atherosis, thereby improving uteroplacental perfusion and pregnancy outcome. Whether statins also would improve long-term cardiovascular health in this group is neither known nor tested. Finally, the review suggests future opportunities for research at this interactive border between maternal and fetal tissues, including more research on trophoblast invasion routes, on whether trophoblast cells could also represent precursors of the foam cells, and whether acute atherosis truly identifies women at highest risk for premature cardiovascular disease. More information can be found at age.org, where this paper and video is available free of charge.